I mean, there's a generic rule of thumb, which is your net worth needs to be equivalent to the loan size and uh, your liquidity needs to be 10% of that minimum. Certain banks, certain lenders, whether it's bridge, agency, or bank debt, can skew that slightly, but that's the generic rule of thumb. All right, well, welcome back to the Real Estate Syndicator Live episode 22, and I am pumped for today's episode. I was telling uh, our guest, Alex, before we uh, went on the air here that you wouldn't think I'd be pumped about this particular topic of key principle. You'd, you'd think I'd be pumped about, I don't know, something else, some new rule or something. But uh, I think there's just been so much um, chatter in the community and just in social media in general about key principles, uh, KP and, you know, how it works. And, you know, even somebody was commenting today, it seemed like it was kind of a hush hush thing. And so uh, I'm really excited to have Alex Kogan with us today. Uh, he is the, uh, and I'll have you uh, introduce yourself a little bit, Alex, but uh, the, the big picture for me is he's, he's the president of Ashland Capital. Um, and what's really exciting for me is not only he's been doing this for a long, long time, over, I think over 20 years, but just like Eric Stewart from last week's episode, who was a, a, a lender, a broker, uh, Alex is a syndicator. So he's not just, you know, a KP that just kind of shows up and he's got a huge net worth and balance sheet and just lends it out. He's actually a syndicator. He's doing the thing. He's been a very successful syndicator over the years. Uh, and then KP is one of the things he does. But, um, I, you know, I first, I think, met in person with Alex a couple of, three years ago, and I think in New York for, for an event that a good friend, uh, Jonathan Toombley, was putting together. And I just remember Alex being super open, super, you know, willing to share, you know, what, what the charges were, what, what, what goes into becoming a KP, what they were looking for. And so I, I thought it'd be a great, uh, a great topic. So without further ado, Alex, you want to just give a brief uh, overview so that those of you who don't know you, or those of we're on the call that don't you just kind of get a little, little bit of background from you. Yeah, thanks, Mauricio. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Um, I won't bore you guys, but I'll just give you a, a quick snapshot of what I've done over the last 24 years in, in my professional career. I, I started out, I, I came from a, a real estate development family. So my, my dad did it, my brother's doing it still. Um, but I started out in construction and real estate development. We started in Colorado. In 98, started a firm where we built high-end luxury homes, designed build firm. We also developed small multifamily, some mixed use. And I did that for about a 20-year run. And along the way, I started buying all types of real estate for my own account, so to speak. I didn't syndicate uh, until about four or five years ago and assembled all kinds of properties, single family, multifamily, college rentals, which we now call student housing in its official name. Um, and then about five years ago, well, we, we self-managed. It became a, a very you know, good size, you know, fortunately for me, uh, portfolio, but very difficult to manage. And that was the transition point where I, I decided to sell that portfolio and transition into buying only larger assets, 100 plus doors, what I'm sure all you guys have heard before. Uh, and, and then I also sold the original operating company, which is the construction development firm in, uh, in 2019. So since 17, that is what I've been doing, transitioning from smaller assets to uh, larger assets all over the country. We are about uh, 2,500 doors and then about 1,500 student housing beds uh, under management. And then along the way, um, as, as Mauricio alluded to, uh, guys came to me and said, you know, can you be a KP? And some of them, um, you know, are looking for different things. We can certainly talk about what that means today. But people started asking, can I lend my balance sheet? Can I mentor them? Can I help raise equity? You know, a whole gamut of, of services and help that uh, newer sponsors were looking for. So we've, we kind of have this unofficial uh, service, if you will and very flexible with how we structure it, depending on what the needs of, of the sponsor, a uh, newer syndicator uh, is, so. That's awesome. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's awesome, great. Thanks for sharing that. And, and, and I will also mention, and I don't think I'm speaking out of line because it's on your LinkedIn profile, but you're also a member of Tiger 21, which is pretty impressive. Uh, you, you've got to have uh, some some pretty meaty financials to be a part of that. If you if anybody's, uh, anybody heard of Tiger 21, can dro drop me a comment there, but. Uh, uh, so you're a member of that, which is very, very impressive. But let's, you know, as we always like to say, we don't want to leave any investors behind. We've got some syndicators who obviously have been doing this for a long time. And then we've got sort of some newbies uh, just kind of starting out. So um, why don't you tell us in your words, 
what the hell is a KP and why do we need one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, what a key principle is, I think, by most people's definition. And, and then I can, you know, touch a little bit about all the variations and offshoots of what we do, depending, again, on what people, what people need. But a key principle traditionally in the, in the newer syndication model, which I think, you know, has been five to 10 years roughly, has been somebody who is in effect, to boil it down, a loan guarantor. So if you, um, you have a deal, but you don't have the net worth and liquidity, as well as the resume to, to get um, agency debt or even bank debt, then you need a key principle. You need somebody that the bank is comfortable with, with their net worth, with their liquidity and their experience to feel comfortable loaning on that asset. And simply put, that's that's what a, a key principle does. In, in the, what are those requirements, the net, where you mentioned net worth and liquidity? Uh, and by the way, before you answer that, remember guys, if you guys wanna, this is mostly for, for the community to ask questions. So if you've got a question, just pop it in the chat for me, please. Uh, I've got a couple of tee-ups here, but uh, really want to make sure we're answering your specific questions. Um, what are those What are those uh, liquidity and net worth requirements and if they changed or if they've been the same since the last time you're not connected? I mean, there's a generic rule of thumb, which is your net worth needs to be equivalent to the loan size and uh, your liquidity needs to be 10% of that minimum. Certain banks, certain lenders, whether it's bridge, agency, or bank debt can skew that slightly but that's the generic rule of thumb. Yeah, and the nice thing about that is that it's, you know, it doesn't have to be the sponsor, the one person. It's, you know, just like everything else, this is kind of a team sport. So it's really, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, but it's the, it's the net worth total of the sponsor group. So if you've got five or six people as a sponsor group, then you're going to look at the net worth of all five or six people and make sure that's uh, matching the loan amount. And in terms of 10% liquidity, same thing. Uh, my understanding, Alex, is that most people have the issue with liquidity. Is that, would that be your assessment or is it, is it pretty equal? I, I think um, what I've seen is people have uh, uh, a, a deficit in all three categories, whether it's net worth, liquidity, or experience. Yeah. They're, they're all three apply. All right. you, know, you might have experience flipping homes, for example, and you started flipping homes or you were in, you know, uh, you had a, uh, a duplex or a tenplex, whatever it is. When a lender looks at you and you're, you're ready to buy a hundred plus unit, they're going to really scrutinize, um, you know, what type of experience you have owning and operating those types of assets. So it, experience plays into it significantly. I was going to say, I'm glad you mentioned that because I'd always kind of focus on the financial part, the, the net worth and, and the 10%, but, and I hadn't really, I mean, obviously I know that, but I hadn't really thought of that as kind of the, the key principle role as well. So that's, that's good stuff. Uh, and then liquidity wise, is that cash in the bank? What, what is liquidity? What counts towards that 10%? Sure. It's, it's got to be readily accessible. So that's kind of the simple way to think about it. It's either cash in the bank, but uh, they will also accept uh, equity. So if you have, you know, an account with Schwab or wherever it is, and you've got $2 million that that's, that's technically liquid, that, that should satisfy them. I will make just backing up one, um, I think, clarification um, that I wanted to make when Mauricio said you can aggregate, let's just say you have three guys and you have $3.3 million uh, each of net worth and a, and a combined of 10 million. That doesn't always satisfy certain lenders. In fact, we've had sponsorship groups come to us and say, yes, in aggregate, we're, we're X, Y, Z, but the bank is still not comfortable because there's not one really strong borrower. You have, call it three newer syndicators, but still collectively, um, there's a lot more scrutiny today than there ever has been. We've got crazy debt markets as we know, and we also have an impending recession. So there is a lot more scrutiny when it comes to this right now than there ever has been before, at least in the last 10 years, no mystery why. So um, that's something you just have to be really um, you know, and here's, here's not to even complicate it more, but let's just say you're wanting to do a deal. You have three banks that you're talking to, three lenders. One of them may be, may be comfortable with your net worth and liquidity and experience level, and their terms are pretty aggressive. Whereas there's another bank that's got really great terms, but they're not comfortable with your net worth liquidity. So it's really a puzzle that's deal by deal that you're putting together. So the takeaway is have a strong team, have a KP, 
Uh, so you have that flexibility. You don't have to just take whatever, you know, sort of the bank wants to offer you. That's great. Give, let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, let's say that I'm getting a $5 million loan, right? So, so theoretically, I need at least $5 million in net worth. I need $500,000 in cash or cash equivalents, securities or what stock, you know, stock brokerage. Do you typically come in and take the whole thing, the meaning you're going to lend $5 million and five hundred k Or do you just take a portion of that, meaning, hey, between the four of us, we've got $3 million that covered, but we're short two. Alex, can you come in for the two? And, and maybe, hey, Mauricio's got three hundred grand, but we need another couple hundred. Can you talk a little bit about the, what's the typical scenario when you come in? Sure. Well, so when I come in, so you're, you're all signing uh, on the loan together. So it doesn't really matter. So let's just say, for example, that, that there's a, a $10 million net worth requirement and the sponsors have $8 million net worth and they need to shore up that $2 million. When I look at that, that opportunity, I'm still looking at as I'm, I'm signing on a $10 million loan. So to me, it doesn't really matter if somebody, I mean, sure, it's great to know that your, your, your partners on the deal have an $8 million net worth, but it ultimately doesn't matter to me. I'm either going to satisfy the whole loan myself. Um, you have you to know. ask grandma. That's right. <laughs> no, that, that's a good point. Um, so that's, that's, that's good. Let's make sure we're, Oh, you have to ask grandma. It's her house. It's not my house. Oh, let's go mute. Ken, let's get muted on that. I thought you were coming. I'll, I'll mute there for Ken. Um, I had a great follow-up question, but uh, I see that Christopher Telly's has beaten me to it. So I'd rather have it asked by the community. Chris, do you want to you wanna unmute and ask your question? Because that was my next question. Uh, so thanks, Mauricio. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, I missed, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I was about three or four minutes late. So I missed the explanation, which I'll catch on the, I'll catch on the, uh, the recorded version. Um, but I was really curious to see what, what the split is on the GP when, when a KP comes in and lends their balance sheet. Uh, and as you just said, when I'm glad you said that uh, a moment ago, um, you, you're just looking at it as you're, you're signing on the whole loan. Um, to satisfy it, but you know, from a from an operator's perspective, I'm just trying to get my hand, my arms around, you know, what do you give up for the balance sheet support? So um, I'll tell you, there's there's a range, and there's a reason that, that there's a range. It it really for us is an evaluation of risk. So number one, it has to do with the type of debt. Is it bridge debt? Is it, is it long-term fixed rate debt? Is it, is it uh, agency debt? So there is an evaluation of the type of loan that it's going to be. If we feel that it's more risky, if we feel that the sponsor is really inexperienced, even though we like them and wanna work with them, um, it's a sliding scale. So the scale that we look at is generally between 10 and 20% of the GP. Uh, and the size of the deal. So, you know, if you bring us a deal, we could do a $50 million deal if, if you wanted to, and we're capable of doing that. Um, you know, the, the, the GP promote percentage could potentially be less on a $50 million deal versus a $10 million deal because there's certain economies of scale for us. But that's, cool. that's, that's generally the rule of thumb. Um, and then I could even get much more granular. I mean, there's, so that's, that's just signing on the loan. There's other parts of, of a KP role that we do. So there's of course, earnest money deposits. Do you need, uh, you know, earnest money and pursuit costs? Do you need help running the deal? Do you need help raising equity? So there's a lot of different pieces which start to blend in from just what I call a KP to more of a co-GP partnership. Uh, and we, we do the whole gamut. So um, I, I don't want to, you know, go off on a tangent, Mauricio, but if anybody no. has questions uh, specific to sort of the other layers, I can go into it. I can talk to anybody offline, et cetera. No, absolutely. I mean, I want to get in the weeds. I think everybody here is looking to get in the weeds. We always hear these sort of generic, uh, somebody who's mentioning hush hush stuff. So, I mean, if you've got weed questions, I'd love to get into it. Do you always, one question I'm always curious do you exclusive, there was an assumption in that question and I wasn't going to make that assumption. Do you exclusively take your compensation in the form of GPs or are you sometimes taking it in, I guess, non-GP form, just cash or I don't know, is there any other formula that you do or do other KPs that you know of take non-GP interest? So no, we, we always take a GP interest. I mean, it can be done, you know, what does it mean? So are you getting part of the acquisition fee? Are you getting the promote? Are you getting asset management fees? 
Um, we've structured it different ways depending on the deal. That we've also structured it where we have we get one percent loan guarantor fee plus right. a percentage of the GP. The loan guarantor fee is actually capitalized by the deal, so the sponsor is not necessarily really paying for it. It's no different than than uh, a lender fee to your 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 senior debt broker or if you're using a debt broker, their fee. It's just part of sources and uses that gets capitalized by the deal. Do you see, I've noticed in some some cases, the KP is literally just a KP and they have no, they're really not even a co-sponsor. I think that's just to make it clear, let me put it this way. Uh, not all KPs are co-sponsors, right? I mean, it's possible for you to just to be a KP now. Now in practice, Maybe you want to be a co-sponsor because it's your money on the line. So you want to have a seat at the table and have something to say. But generally speaking, uh, do you often just, just do a KP and just lend the balance sheet? Or do you always want to be involved to some extent to protect your, <laughs> to protect your assets? Well, we're, we're going to be uh, part we're going to be a general partner. So I think um, the way we look at it is we want to be on, on the weekly calls. We want to look over your shoulder to make sure that we're protecting our credit risk. If we feel that there's something, some issue going on in the deal, we are, we have voting rights. We're going to be able to have a say and influence. If a sponsor is doing well and there's no issues, great. That means that, you know, I, we can fall back. We might check in with you once a month. But in the very beginning, we're going to be involved to the level where we can also lend uh, some advice um, and, and protect that credit risk. So, um, you know, and then again, the other end of the spectrum, if you really need us to, to mentor you through the deal, we could talk about a different set of economics where we're truly, like we have a deal right now where we had a, a, a newer sponsor that found the deal and brought us the deal. They could raise all the money and they found the deal. We're doing everything else, right? So they raised the money, but we're completely running that deal. Um, and we're getting certainly better economics to do that. That's a great, that's a great, that's actually a great service because we've had some discussions on the lives where, you know, how do newbies get started? You know, what's the best way if you've never done a deal before? It's kind of a chicken and the egg. We've always talked about writing coattails on an experience, you know, just, hey, add, I mean, Ashley Wilson, we had a great quote from her early on where it's like, just, just figure out what's, how you can add value to the sponsor, whether it's getting their cu cup of coffee, like it doesn't matter, just get in there, earn 2%. But what I'm hearing from you is that you'll actually sort of be the consultant. So if you've got a newbie and they're able to find the deal and, and, and even raise most of the money, if not all the money, you can come in and help them out and just, you know, they can lean on your experience and you can coach them through, which I think is invaluable. So that's good stuff. Yeah, Marissa, I think it gets into, you know, semantics, you know, when do you transition that definition from a KP to uh, what I would call a co-GP or co-sponsor, right? Um, and that's really, you know, a matter of how involved are we going to be and how much time and effort and, and services and risk are we, are we going to take on? But we, we certainly, to us, it's really kind of a, an a la carte menu. You know, if you need help, uh, come to us and we'll figure out what kind of help you need. You know, for us, it's, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a value if somebody finds a great deal. Let's just say that they can find a great deal. They can't raise equity. They, they really knew they don't know what they're doing. Well, that's of great value. Find us a great deal. We'll walk you through. We'll mentor you on that deal. Um, we'll raise all the equity and we'll give you a piece of that deal just because you found the deal. That's so that's the, you know, the yeah, opposite the of extreme. So it goes everything in between. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, Kevin or Irish Kevin, you, you, the first question was a good one. Then I know you got a couple of others. Why don't, why don't you pop on and just maybe ask them one at a time. But the first one about the recourse was interesting. Irish Kevin. Unmute yourself, please. Yes, sir. You had a question about uh, the recourse loan piece. Yeah, great, uh, great event here. Nice to see everybody online. Um, Alex, I myself have been a KP, uh, maybe not to the extent that you have been, but um, like one of my initial questions was, have you ever signed as a KP on a recourse loan? Not for someone else. Uh, in fact, you know, I always try to stay away from recourse loans for the obvious reasons. Uh, but for my own deals or we're the lead sponsor, I've done partial recourse that burn off. So there's a certain metric on, on our NOI that we have to meet and it'll burn off. For outside sponsors where, 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 it's, where we are literally just the KP, uh, we, we will not do uh, recourse. 
if we're <coughs> excuse me if we're partners we're co-gp i would consider a partial recourse loan if necessary so to date you haven't done that right not not as a not as a true kp um you know in, in a hands-off capacity no i would not do that okay and do you always get a piece of the acquisition fee do we always get part of the acquisition fee yes okay and um while i'm on my last thing would be um, <laughs> i've signed before as a kp just to get my fanny make out if you can explain that to the audience um i'm sure you probably familiar with that right now that's a great question did, did how does the yeah talk about that alex and how does how does having being a kp well first of all what is a fannie mae card why do you want one and how does kp help you get one well uh, you know i i think what you're referring to kevin is is basically the the uh, experience that agencies uh require is that what you're referring to correct yeah yeah. yeah. So, so we, we, we do that, you know, we, we've, we've, uh, we have deals with, with both agencies um, and it is, it is more scrutinizing, more challenging to get agency uh, debt if you've never been a KP. So they, they definitely want you to have experience and even to complicate matters more, um, they're even going, they're even scrutinizing if you've never transacted in a specific market. So if you're new to Texas or wherever, you're looking to do a deal um they're looking at that very carefully as well right now yeah and then the other thing i might add um mauricio was you know a couple of reasons why i signed on as a kp like for other people in the audience like if you're learning to get into the business it's a great way you know once you vet the sponsors and, and you find the right jockey so to speak and they need a kp it's a great way to get into like a group or a team. And then, you know, hopefully down the road, they'll say, look at now we need you as a co GP or some other piece of the puzzle or team. So for me, it was like a kind of a stepping stone. I don't know how, how Alex started his like KPing, so to speak, but it was kind of my way of getting into the door and it's actually helped me, you know, to get into other deals and the sponsorship and all that. So I just wanted to pull that out there. No, that's a, that's a great point. And, and, and maybe it's a question. I actually had it as one of my questions that, that really wasn't part of the answer that I was expecting. But one of my kind of basic questions, Alex, was, was you know, wh why do people get into KPing? And uh, obviously, it's a good way to make a living and stuff. You get paid. But, but maybe there's something else as well in terms of relationships and meeting people. And, and, and in your case, you even said finding deals. Yeah, it, it, for me, it was all of the above. I mean, nobody minds a little extra income, a little piece of the promote, et cetera. For me, it was being in the middle of deal mix because there's guys who have a great deal, but they can't get it done. They need a guy like me. Great. It's, it's a win-win for both of us. Um, so it was really just meeting people being in the middle of all the deal flow. Um, I will make one, one, one comment. I think, you know, Kevin, if, if you... Um, I don't know if you know this, but there's something KPs need to be very careful. If you have a deal with certain bridge lenders that I won't mention names, but if you have a deal that is, is actually struggling, uh, and then especially for the agencies, if you have a deal that goes bad and gets into distress, that agency or that bridge lender or certain banks, you'll be on an unofficial blacklist and you will never get a loan from that, that, that agency again. Um, so it, it's something that, you know, just a word of advice for anybody who's even considering being a KP, if you can, can you be very, very careful. And that's why staying involved and understanding what cycle of, of, of the deal is it in right now? Are, are you stabilized? Are you in a vulnerable position? That's why we're very careful to watch the deal as, as most value, uh, value add deals get stabilized, because that's where you can get in trouble. Is that without the uh, bad boy carve-outs? That's exactly. It doesn't matter. So, so here's what could happen. You can have a bad boy carve-out and, and, and a deal can go bad and you won't be held uh, personally. But if you can never borrow again from an agency or a bank or a bridge lender, that limits your business. Uh, and for me, that would be devastating. I mean, if, if, if being a KP or, or you know, being in this business is a little bit of a sideline, you might have a day job. That, that's one thing. But for me, this is this is all I've done for, for almost 25 years now. 
So if I couldn't go out and borrow money from an agency or a handful of good bridge lenders or banks, that would be crippling for my business. Right. And so now Alex, can, 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 can you please repeat what would put you on that unofficial blacklist again? So in 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 the, so officially, if you have a deal that goes bad, let's say that you have a deal like that that ultimately uh, you give back to the bank. If if it's with a uh, an agency, they're never going to lend you again. Forget it. You're you're done. But even if it doesn't get that bad, if you have a deal that's struggling, that's in distress, and clearly the bank knows about it, you're going to be talking to them. They're going to be very, very reticent to lend to you again. So it doesn't matter if, if it goes bad, if it's even if it's struggling. Banks don't want to go through that again. They want to take risk off the table, not not take on further risk. So you will be challenged to borrow again, even if a deal is struggling. Thank that's you. Good to, that's that's good to know. But would it also uh, include um, like bridge debt or any type of uh, like local bank? A hundred percent. It's community banks, it's bridge lenders, it's agency debt. I mean, think about it. It's anybody who's giving out money is managing their risk. And if they have a sponsor that is, has struggled the next next go around, they're going to look at you three times more carefully and say, I don't, I don't think I want to take that risk. Yeah, so I think they, they, they may not tell you it's because you struggled in the last go around, but when they tell you they can loan you, you know, 40% LTV at 9% interest rate, they're unofficially telling you they don't want to do business with you. <laughs> and Dan, I know you, is that your, was that kind of answering your question? Or was that sort of a, a follow-up? Cause you, you talked about the risk with agency debt. Dan, you want to just pop in? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just, oh, I also should mention, Alex, I saw the picture on your LinkedIn of you and Shaq, and I asked which one of you is Shaq. I, <laughs> I, I answered that for everybody. You got a jacket, and that's the way you know it's you. But uh, my my question here, actually, yeah, my statement was more about how uh, uh, just if you, if you sign uh, with agency debt, uh, access and um, and you're basically not really active if they drive by and see it's not being taken care of then yeah you'll, you'll end up getting blacklisted like you said that was my two cents but nice to meet you good to meet you uh, I was actually as I'm stalling here I was actually going to pull this up here let's see here I just uh, yeah I saw that picture with Shaq so that was uh that was pretty awesome. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I, I, can, I can throw it up here too. Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna. Oh, man, uh, sh sh there we go. Marisa, right, do you go. mind if I cut in one more time? Yeah, yeah. There it is. There it is. Look, oh, look at that. Geez. Look at that. That was a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, that was a few weeks ago, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go. Uh, go ahead. Is that Christopher? No, I was Kevin. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Kevin. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Alex, like back to that. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to call it a blacklist or whatever, but. Um, how would that be, like, how would they know? Like, how would that, would that be listed somewhere? Like with the uh, lending, like institution? I mean, agency, I could see how they might have a blacklist, but what about when it comes to the other lenders that aren't really? It's, it's, I mean, it's just internal. So when you, when, you know, let's just say you borrow money from ABC Bank uh, and you're struggling. Well, they, they know you're struggling. You're not, when you go back to them for another loan, even if you, you know, pulled it together and you exited the deal and you paid them back. When they go back to their credit committee, credit committees have all that information. They say, you know what, he pulled it off, but he struggled. It's, it's just going to be harder for you. It's not an official list. I mean, it's, it's just the banks keep records and they manage their risk and they're going to know who they want to, you know, continue lending to and who they don't or, or who they want to you know, just be much more scrutinizing with. Thanks for that. And I've got a ton of questions coming in, guys. So I appreciate that as I'm going through. I'm trying to go in order, but uh, Ashley Gardner, you want to ask your, your question? Unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Hey there. Um, excuse the voice. I dodged COVID up until now and it finally got me, but uh, <laughs> oh, sorry to hear that. That's all right. So you mentioned uh, a great deal and I know I'm going to ask you, what constitutes a great deal in your mind? And I, I know that the main part of the answer is, well, it depends, but you know, um, the, the things are changing now with cap rates and IRRs and inflation and whatnot. And I just wondered if you had any direction on that, uh, what you like to see when people bring you a deal. 
So I'll tell you that we look at it through two different lenses. If it's a deal, if you come to me and you say, I just need a KP, right? We're going to look at it from a credit risk and debt service uh, um, analysis. Do we think that this sponsor, do we think that Ashley can, can pull this together and, and, and make the debt service and keep this deal healthy? That, that's, that's sort of our first lens. And if we do, then we're going to continue the conversation. And, and if we like you and, and you know, you're, you're, you're a good guy, I know what you're doing, you're committed then, then we'll, we'll likely do the deal. If you come to us and you say, you know, we need a KP and we need help with raising equity and being much more involved, then we're going to look at it and say, what is a great deal? And our lens is, is different because if I'm going to bring equity to the table, I want to, I want to have very high conviction that I'm going to be able to, 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 to meet or beat the returns that we advertise to our investors. So it's much more scrutinizing. I'm going to look at you know, all different kinds of things, the, you know, the market, the deal, your underwriting, your assumptions, uh, the type of debt you're putting on it. Is it, you know, there's a whole thing of, of how we look at deals every day. We're underwriting, you know, tens, you know, 10 to 20 deals probably a day. And we would look at it through that a completely different lens. And if we like the deal, then we'd be willing to partner with you in a more meaningful way. Um, whether it's earnest money, whether it's, you know, mentoring you throughout the deal, but primarily uh, bringing equity because I never want to go to investors and say, hey, uh, I'm sorry, here's your money back, but you made no money. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Good stuff. Uh, Sh uh, Sean, I'm going to ask you, Sean asks, do you have anyone on your team that's a broker dealer? We don't. No. Yeah, throw that out there. Um, I think Chris, I'll put, uh, I've got Alex's info. I know Chris wanted to connect. So I'll, I'll make sure that I put his contact info and other stuff that he reach out. Uh, so, Samir says a lot of great info here. You're drinking from a fire hose. Are you planning to send out the recording? Yeah, I'll send it. We usually always, no, usually we always send out the replay to, to, to you, everybody on here. I have your email because that's how you got here. So uh, I'll send out a copy of the replay. And then we also post it on the Facebook group, our community and real estate syndicator community, which is a great community if you're not a part of it. And I'll put a link down there as well. But um, so Susan says dangerous to do recourse deals. I don't know if that's a question or a statement, but I would agree on both the statement and the question. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, it's absolutely dangerous. I mean, it, it is exactly what it says. If you, if a deal goes bad um, and if I borrow $20 million from the bank and I can only pay them back 15, uh, they're going to go after me for that extra five million. That, and uh, so now we've lost all the investor equity, which is the worst part of it. And then, uh, then as a sponsor, I also have to come out of pocket with five million dollars and pay the bank. So, yes, it's it's a huge deal. Yeah. Uh, Brendan, you want to ask your question about um, the refinancing? Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I was just curious what happens, you know, if you if you come in as a KP and, you know, in a couple of years you decide to do a refinance, business plans going as expected, kind of what happens with a KP at that point? Is there more fees or, you know, just kind of walk me through what I would expect at that point? That's a good question. I mean, uh, in general, nothing happens other than uh, potentially, I, I've never have done it, but um, I have a friend who, who does, um, you know, some KP work as well. And he gets an additional fee at 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 a at a refinance because it just takes more work from the um, from the KP. You got to you know you basically have another financial enema, and uh, it takes more work and time. But that's about it. You stay in the deal um, in a liquidity event, a refi. Typically, you're just you know obviously returning some capital to investors. Um, so that's it. Nothing really changes. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Good question. So, sorry, I was a little distraught. I literally have been gone out of the office physically for about a week and I came back and I'm, I had like an ant infestation. So like crawling all over me. So you see me freaking, not freaking out, but like, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, James, you, uh, I know you're in the middle. Uh, I appreciate the comments about being timely that you're, you're doing a self storage conversion deal and you're having a couple of issues here. And um, so if you want to go ahead and ask your question, James. Yeah, I'll jump on. I'll try and keep it short too. But basically, it's about a $6.5 million deal. It's a warehouse that we're going to convert from 35,000 square foot warehouse into 50,000 net rentable storage. 
Um, I oversee 17 storage facilities right now for a family up in Washington. So, you know, ha have the knowledge, have the underwriting, don't have the personal assets. And so I went into it thinking I would, my LPs would not have to sign and, and had a, a bank promising some pretty high things and, and not able to deliver. Um, and so now it's taken me to a point where I've got to go kind of renegotiate trade and, and try and not get bent over the barrel um, too bad, um, unless there's a way to find a better banking relationship that maybe will do non-recourse or something. I mean, it's a it's a very strong deal, and I think there's there's quite a lot of cushion in the, even the completed value versus the money in. Um, but what state? I mean, what state is it deal in? Washington State. Okay. Southern Washington. Yeah, I mean, connect with me offline. I mean, I, I could potentially help. Um, I mean, there's no reason uh, if, if it's that. I mean, it's it's unstabilized. So I think I guess that's that's where it lies the problem that most banks are going to want recourse because it's unstabilized. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I would look at it. Uh, that's all I could say. I would look at, at, at the business plan and understand it. And if I like it, um, I might be able to to help out. Cool. Love to yeah. talk. Yeah, and Alex, when I when we we get off, if you want to peruse the chat, a few people have left their their info that wanted to connect with you. But I'll also I'll also make sure we everybody gets your info if he wants to connect. Yeah, that'd be great. Anybody um, who wants to reach out, email. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Just just reach out. Yeah, I'll put the email and the thing link in the link. In, in the meantime, I think uh, where did I see that question? So ooh, it got away from me. Um, Where'd it go? Oh, uh, Mustafa was asking, I'll ask it for you. Cause I think, I think I, Mustafa say, how often have you started as a KP only, but ended up having to get more involved? I think you mentioned uh, before that you, 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 have you never done it or you just currently don't do KP only? No, we, we do KP only, but it is not uncommon to start out as a KP and whatever is happening throughout the process which I mean, I could cite one example without saying who it is. Um, a younger syndicate it wasn't the first time that he syndicated. He was, you know, a co-GP, part of another group. Um, couldn't raise the equity. Number one was about to lose his earnest money deposit. Also, really did not know uh, how to navigate um, a lot of the deal. You know, won't go on and on. But uh, long story short, we ended up coming in bringing. Uh, half the equity and, and um, we ended up being, you know, 50, 50 partners on a deal because that's what it evolved into. Cool. And I just dropped Alex, oh, wait, I didn't misspell it. Alex's uh, email, alex at nationalcapitalfund.com. And uh, I didn't just drop his cell number. He actually said that I could, we could drop a cell number, which is. Cell is in there, it looks like. What's that again? Email. The email is above uh, Jan. Jan, Jan, I saw your comment there. We'll, we'll do that as an AMA because that has to do more with, with asset protection. I saw that question. So it's the last, oops, yeah. I got deleted. yeah, everything. Um, Christopher, keep going. I want maybe maybe five more minutes here, not to keep Alex here too long, but uh, Chris, you had a question about uh, co-GPing stuff. Uh, so yeah, thanks again uh, for, the, for the moment. Um, so, you know, maybe this is better offline, but uh, maybe uh, there's some other people online that would benefit from this. I'm kind of curious to see if if they're in a co-GP situation where you're actively providing more support, or, or I should maybe the better the question is, would you provide more support in terms of expenses for the operators that are um, they're, they're struggling for for with with uh, with capital to put into their into their deals initially, uh, plus the 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 the, the, um, uh, uh, the balance sheet support. Uh, you know what? If you work in those situations, what what would the the, the, the GP split atypically kind of look like? So I'm going to give you again a little bit of a of a range because um, it, it's unique to the situation. Number one is I don't like to take risk that uh, is high risk. So um, simply put, so if a sponsor doesn't have any money and, um, and they're responsible for raising the equity, then they have no skin in the game. That means if they don't raise the equity and I've put up quarter million dollars of an earnest money deposit 
you know, maybe 25 to 30,000 of pursuit costs, legal, et cetera. They have no skin in the game. They don't raise the equity, big deal. Who loses the money? Me. So I don't do it um, if I don't have control of raising the equity also. Um, so I, number one, I need to have high conviction you can raise the equity. Uh, if I don't, then I would do it, but it would have to be secured in some way. Let's just say you have equity in your house. I'll take a second position on your house. Um, you have uh, general partnership cash flow interest in other deals. You would, you know, assign those just in case um, you lost the earnest money and you had to pay me back. So we would have to, you know, so there's a number of ways we can structure it, whether it's secured or unsecured. Um, I don't have an exact, you know, I'll charge you 10% more of the GP or I'll charge you this, that. It's really case by case. Um, the best scenario is I have high conviction in you. We're both raising the equity. By the way, if we're co-GPs, the economics change significantly. There's a different formula if we're co-GPs and true partners where I'm not even really getting a fee for the KP portion. It's, I'm just throwing that into the deal. So, um, you know, I, I wish I can give you just a menu of cut and dry formula but it's really uh, specific on your situation. I'm happy to talk to any of you guys offline and uh, <clears throat> understand what your need is. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Emma, I saw your hand go up or good friend Emma Powell, you, uh, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, um, so I'm curious, how do, you get, how do you get in front of people? Because I feel like I've got, net worth and liquidity to the point where I could do some small stuff. I have Fanny experience. I've signed on a, a basically every deal I've ever done as a, as a KP, like a GP and also new development, new construction experience. And so I'm kind of starting to, to look at my options in this area, but I'm not really sure how to find the, how to find the people who are needing somebody with my particular skill set. Would it be, do I send out like like a little REO above my lending experience? How, how would that look? That's a good, good question. I don't, you know, you're looking at it. This is the only thing I do. I don't market it. Um, it's really just kind of a, a sideline uh, for me. I mean, we're, we're quite busy with what we're doing. So I, I don't really actively market it. Um, Mauricio calls and I say, sure, I'll, I'll jump on. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. I literally sent him a message like I think last week or something. Like, hey, would you be willing to come on? He's like, tell me when, where, and I'll be there. And I'm like, wow, thank you so much. <laughs> so Alex, you found me when we were looking at doing some KP stuff on some of the deals that we were looking at. You reached out to me. I don't even remember how we got introduced. Um, how, do you, so do you, are you watching Facebook groups and just private messaging people or how do you? Uh, I, 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 think I, I think I reached out to you because I saw a development deal. I think it was in Salt Lake. Um, and that just piqued my interest that that was simply it. Okay. Uh, so yeah. And I see, and I've seen Alex pop in, I've seen Alex pop in in social. I mean, you, you, there's a discussion on LinkedIn or, or Facebook or whichever ones you're active. And, you know, for example, Hey, how much the KP is charged? And then, and Alex will get in there. And so it, that's why social is so powerful too. Right. Okay. That's, that's good. To yeah. keep putting I, mean, it I, I would say, you know, truly think about whether you want to do it all the risks involved and if it's a good use of your time. Um, that, that, that would be my biggest suggestion. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, a couple more here. Douglas, uh, you have your hand up and you have a question about the asset classes if you wanna ask. Yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna follow up on. Uh, Alex, do you have a particular uh, preference in terms of food groups uh, that you don't like, that you'd like us to not bring you if, if we come across anybody who needs a KP, somebody you would not like to hear from? Uh, and also like uh, ground up, it sounds like you, you would look at particular ground up deals that might be interesting. I would look at ground up if it was non-recourse, but unfortunately most deals to capitalize and get good debt, you're gonna have to do full recourse or at least partial recourse. So it's, it's a challenge, I will look at them. I may be interested in partnering on a ground up deal if I really like it. And then if I'm, if I'm in the driver's seat, then you know, I would consider uh, recourse or partial recourse. But the main, the two main verticals that we do, of course, conventional multifamily and student housing. Student housing at an institutional level of 100 beds or more. Uh, I'll look at self-storage. I'll look at industrial. Uh, I don't really want to look at retail. Don't want to look at office. I will look at a conversion 
you know, from office um, or retail to one of the other verticals. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Moses, you had a question on uh, rate caps. Yes, um, thanks, uh, Mauricio. Alex, um, more and more I'm noticing, and this was specifically on agency debt, but I'm, I'm assuming a bridge has it as well. How do you de-risk yourself when you have rate caps? Let's say it was purchased two years ago, it was much, much less than it is today. But what I'm noticing, a lot of the sponsors may not even notice that the rate caps do expire. And Absolutely. then you, like today you would have a, 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 you know, I don't want to say margin call, but a capital call from the lender saying, hey, you need to cough up a 30,000 escrow a month for the next 12 months. Uh, just so you have money to repurchase a cap that throws the deal into an insane, you, you know, cash flow problem. But how do you, do you, how do you look at that when you're KPing a deal? So, well, no, number one, I um, mean, we have to like, we, when we look at a deal, whether it's our own or someone else's, we want to sort of look into the future and say, what could get us in trouble, right? Where, how is it underwritten? Is it underwritten at a really low cap rate to refi in, in two years? Well, well, that's not gonna happen, right? So, um, you know, there's a lot of risk right now with, with, the, with the type of environment in it. So we're gonna look at it in the same lens that you should be looking at it. So it's the right debt, preferably fixed rate debt. Um, is it a heavy lift? I mean, how quickly can you get to stable, stabilization and cash flow? And, and what, you know, what's, what's the underwriting that's going to get you there? If it's aggressive underwriting, I wouldn't be interested. And you're going to end up being like one of the guys who is, um, you know, has got negative cash flow and you're going to be forced to sell. And, and unfortunately, that's going to happen. And that's an opportunity for guys who can step in and, and, and buy at, at the right price after guys have gotten in trouble. So I don't know if I'm asking your, answering your question, but you know, either get yourself a tight rate cap that matches where you think the asset will go, right? Uh, which is going to be expensive. It's very expensive to buy a tight cap rate. Um, you're, you're better off, you know, what we're doing a lot is community bank debt, fixed rate debt. It's lower leverage, it's lower risk, but um, like we're closing a deal on Monday. I've got four and a half percent debt, five years, three years of IO, no prepayment penalty. So it's open at par, which is beautiful. So it's flexible debt. If I want to sell tomorrow, somebody offers me a bunch of money or I want to, you know, refi or I want to sell in four or five years, I have all that flexibility. So I think that's the best debt you can get right now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. All right. Last one. And uh, this comes from Susan, but I'm going to ask it because um, I actually had a slightly different question, but we're also going to ask Susan question. So the question, I guess, is, and I'm asking everybody that comes on, uh, and I'm going to try and frame it with Susan's. Uh, Alex, in the current market, how difficult is it to raise capital? Would be sort of my more generic one. So that's question number one. And then the second, the, Susan's real question was in the current market, how difficult do you find it to raise capital without a specific deal? But let's start with a general, like what's going on out there in the markets right now? You know, stock markets down. People are. Do you find it a little bit harder? To, 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 to get a check from investors or what's going on right now in your, from your lens? Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, we, we've, we, we haven't struggled. Um, you know, we've got, I've got a good loyal base of over 20 years, so we've been doing well, but I constantly uh, am seeing even our investors that have all the faith in the world in us, you know, I think I'll sit out on this deal. I mean, we've got a deal that we're returning over 30% IRR that we're selling in about a month. And we just asked some of our investors if they want to roll that in a 1031 in the next deal. I was shocked to see that several of our high net worth investors said, no, I think I'll just take that, take, take the distribution. So obviously something says to them, I'm a little nervous where things are going. I'll take the money now rather than roll it in another deal and they'll, they'll pay their capital gains today. So I would say, yes, um, there's a lot of um, deer in headlights. People are just trying to see what's going to happen. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, the wealthier your investor base, I think the easier it's going to be to raise equity. So they truly have to have a lot of disposable income. Um, and if it's, if it's people who just barely meet the accredited uh, or even non-accredited um, uh, criteria, I think those are going to be harder and harder to raise equity from in today's market. 
that's great. Great answer there. And then specifically about raising capital without, do you, do you ever raise capital without a specific deal, which I guess in my mind would be, a, I guess that's a fund. Uh, do, do you do any of that? No, we're not a fund. We only raise deal by deal. Yeah. And I'll, and I can answer that Susan, just from my experience. I mean, it, it is harder in general, forget about the market today. It is harder to raise capital uh, from a fund because, you know, investors are literally betting on you. They don't, they don't have no idea what, well, they have some idea what you're buying, but they can't, you know, review your, the financials or the, where the prop is located in the market and, and make their own assumptions. They can't challenge your assumptions because you're not really giving them any, you're just giving them sort of parameters of what you're going to buy. So it is much harder. I think somebody like Alex, who's a seasoned guy, who's, who's got the loyal base, as you mentioned, you know, that that's one thing. Uh, but if you've never raised capital before, or you're just starting out and you don't have that track, but it definitely is harder to, to raise capital in a fund than it is a, a project specific, simply because investors can't challenge your assumptions on a project specific. So Right. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. I agree with you. I mean, you know, having said that, I mean, I think you need to talk to people, your investor base, well before you have a deal. You constantly need to be talking to them. You are raising, in effect, uh, by warming them up for the next opportunity. Um, but no, I mean, especially as a newer sponsor, I, I don't think it would make sense to even attempt to, to do a fund, you know, raise deal by deal, get a track record, and then consider a fund. Yeah, that's so. I'm glad you said that. I mean, we talk about that all the time. That you know, the last thing you want to do is, is is send your first email to your investor base when you have a deal. You want to constantly be communicating. Uh, that communication is really what makes that list valuable. Warm it up so that when you do actually have a deal, it's not the first time they've heard from you in two years. So, I, you know what? I, I, there's one, one, actually two points that are yeah, relevant please, that I think yep. are going to be helpful to to the folks that are on tonight. Number one, what we can help with is that I've done for a lot of sponsors is. We'll lend our, our track record, literally our, our portfolio resume to a newer sponsor um, when they go out and try to win a deal. So whether it's off market or on market, you know, certainty of close is extremely important today. So if I'm a seller and a newer sponsor comes to me, I'm not gonna take them seriously. If we have a, a, a newer sponsor that's listed on, on a deck of Ashton Capital and Ashton Capital's behind it, then I'm going to take that much more seriously. So we can help you. If you find a deal, we're happy to help in, in the acquisition so that you're taken seriously. Um, that was the one point I want to bring up. <laughs> you still lost your train of thought. <laughs> I, think, I think I lost my second point. Maybe come back. That's all right, my friend. Hey, look, I really, really appreciate it. I, I kept you a little bit longer than I'd promised. So really appreciate. I know you're super busy. I know things are going really well for you and uh, really, really appreciate the time. And on behalf of the entire community, Thank you for joining us, Alex. My pleasure, guys. Reach out anytime, and uh, it's great to see you, Mauricio. Yeah, great to see you. And I'm going to stick around for a little bit to answer. I've got at least one question that, I've, that Jan's been, been, been asking here. for. It's an, actually an asset protection question, but uh, I'll let you guys uh, thank Alex in the chat there. And um, Alex, if you want to go through the chat, there's a couple of people that wanted to connect directly, even, and obviously your contact information's in there. It's, again, it's Alex at ashlandcapitalfund.com. And I'm going to say your cell number out loud, too, 970 seven five nine five nine five nine since this is yeah i'll stay on for a few minutes yeah. um but yeah feel free to reach out guys that's awesome well, i appreciate that uh and jan i know you've been super patient and this is has nothing to do with kp but it's more on the on the asset protection side and uh, by the way you, you nailed it i mean i think uh so, so jan's question is jen are you on i think you are jan gonzalez yeah i am i am right here yeah do you want to do you want me to read it that i have it here or do you want to ask it no, you can read it. That's fine. Yeah. So you said you, you were trying to figure out how to structure your entities for syndication and that, that we, we talked about, it, I think on the second or third RESL, but uh, you understand it. the best way to set up the structure is to open up an LLC, which buys and sells and assigns the real estate. Uh, and then this company will be the one with the money. And then you open up a separate S corp to pay salaries and all that stuff, uh, which is kind of true, but then you had a follow-up, which I think you, you had kind of answered, the, answered your own question, which is, Somebody had told you that you, one, have to create an LLC to buy and hold the commercial real estate, two, create a separate LLC that's taxed as an S-corp, which will manage all assets. This is the operations company, and this company can also manage syndications. There's no need to separate, uh, need a separate company to do syndication. So let me just summarize the structure because this is going to apply to everyone. You, you're going to have two separate, sometimes a third one if you've got a holding company, but generally you're going to have your syndication LLC which is your property LLC. Typically that's created in the state where the property is located. Sometimes lenders these days are you know, insisting that, that it gets up in Delaware and then you got to re register it. But let's say you're buying a property in Phoenix, Arizona. You're going to want to create an Arizona limited liability company 
to hold title to that. And that's going to be typically your syndication LLC. That's where that's the LLC where all the investors are going to be coming in that uh, uh, they're going to be get issuing, you know, shares of that company or membership units in that company. Separate from that, somebody needs to manage that company, right? And that's going to be the manager or the operating company or the real estate company. There's lots of different names for it. Or the GP really is more of the vernacular we're using. That is typically for, and this is a tax reason, typically it's, it's taxed as either an S corp or a C corp, but really it is an S corp. The, the, the last few times I've talked to the, to the CPAs. Again, I would structure it as an LLC and just make the election to, to, to get taxed as an S election. And so that is your operating, that's your brand company, right? That's your website. That's the name of the company. So for, for, for not to steal from, from Alex here, but you know, Alex has Ashland Capital. I think it's Ashland Capital. So, so that's his GP. If you, that's his website. You go on, you know, if you meet him at a, at a conference and he gives you a business card, I don't know if people still do that, but if you have a business card, uh, it'll be like, you know, Alex, president of you know, Ashland Capital. That's, that's not going to own anything. That's going to be simply the manager, the GP, which is going to do all the work, get all the fees, acquisition fees, asset management fees, and then the cash flow. Uh, no, not the cash flow, the acquisition fee, the asset management fee, and maybe the refinance fee or whatever. Then the owner of the property, which is going to be you, you're going to own some percentage eight, on an 80-20 split. You're going to own 20% of it or 30% of it, however you structure it. You're going to be a, typically a class B member of the syndication LLC. But you always want to create a separate LLC for every single syndication because no syndic two syndications are alike, unless every single investor is the same. I mean, mathematically, it's possible. But every time you have a new syndication, you're going to create a brand new LLC. You're going to have brand new investors in there, different amount. And then your GP entity, your operating company, will be the manager of that syndication LLC, but it will not own anything. The, the, the trouble, I think, the biggest mistake I see many syndicators make is that they have the same entity manage the syndication and own the syndication, meaning their class B interest, their 20 or 30%. And the challenge there is that all the liability is with the management company, right? The GP. If anything's going to go wrong, then let me mute everybody here. Uh, if everything's going to be wrong, go wrong. You guys can still, sorry. If anything's going to go wrong, the GP entity really is the company that should get sued. So, so if, if Alex screws up here, you know, Ashland Capital is making all the decisions. It's, it's the manager, it's, it's the co-GP or what have you. So that's the company that really should get sued. And so you don't want that company owning anything because all those assets would be fair game to a creditor. So you don't want it to own real estate, you know, and you certainly don't want it to own the class B membership because, you know, that 20%, imagine if you've got five deals and you've got 20% on each of those five deals and the manager owns it, well, that's all fair game. So that's why you want to separate the management side, which is where all the liability is over here, and then hold it in a different entity, which we call a holding company. So I don't know if that answered. If you go to real estate, the, the episode, I want to say it's episode four, uh, one of those early ones. We did an asset protection 101, and it's a lot easier because I've got some schematics and it's easier to follow. Um, and then one of my actually popular flip chart Friday videos I, I go through, I think it's called asset protection for... No, no. How to structure your real, how to structure your syndication entities, or real estate syndication entities. That's another one where I'm actually mapping it out because it's it's difficult to articulate without without a schematic. But uh, so, anyway, so I hope that, yeah. So real quick, so it's just two companies then. That's it. Just yeah, the one that at a minimum. Was, well, at a minimum, yeah. usually it's three to be fair. So we, we talked about the syndication LLC, which is really the think of that as sort of the property LLC because it owns a property and then has all well, the investors. That's the syndication LLC. Then you've got your real estate, let's say your GP, right? The manager that manages is the manager of that LLC and collects all the fees. And then generally yeah. our clients will have a holding company uh, that actually owns the, the valuable asset, the 20% carried interest, whether 20 or 30%. That's usually a holding company. And that's the company that's generally set up in a strong asset protection state, like a Wyoming or Nevada, or sometimes Delaware. Uh, the management company pretty much has to be set up in the state that you live or where you're actually doing business. So if you live in North Carolina, then that's where that, com that management company is going to set, get set up. But your holding company doesn't do anything. It just sits there and holds the asset. And so that's why we can set that up anywhere we want. And so obviously we want to pick a state that's, that's got some good asset protection uh, properties. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jay. I, I appreciate it. I know you sent an email, so I appreciate you sending, uh, you know, and in the future, if anybody wants to send emails when I send that up, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys priority on, on that. Uh, and I'm going to do one more because I do have a, a little bit over already. But Randy, I see this one, and this will be the last one. And uh, this is, I think there's been a, super helpful episode. So Randy, you've got a totally question about compensation for contract referrals, contact referral, sorry. 
Correct. If I is there is there a way to legally provide an incentive for a, a friend or someone who refers an investor to you? Uh, and I've, I've heard that obviously that's not acceptable, but you can perhaps. Yeah, the closest. But yeah, so the question is, can you pay somebody? Can you compensate somebody for for giving you a referral? And when by referral, I presume you mean referring an investor, right? Correct. Uh, and the challenge with that is that you know anytime you get certainly transaction-based compensation, meaning you're only going to get compensated if the investor refers somebody and that investor actually invests, then that's, that's broker-dealer activity. So you, you can't do that. Uh, so the only way around that is, is, is presumably to either be a broker-dealer or, or get yourself or, or, or have a, an investment advisory license, which makes no sense, right? Uh, the, 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 the one that you potentially could do, which I don't talk too much about, but you know, there are finder fees that you could try and you know, it's a very fine line or what's the saying I was gonna say, it's, it's a very, you're, you're putting that, it's, it's just a very tight rope at least that you're going through. But let me give you a classic example, which may not be helpful, but you know, if you, you do, certainly cannot get transaction-based compensation, right? So you're not gonna pay them based on how many people invest. Uh, you're certainly not gonna be involved in the deal or, or, or make any, and this is the, one of the challenges, you can't give any recommendation as to whether this is a good deal or not. So I can't, you know, you're gonna get in trouble when I say, hey, John, uh, Randy's got a deal. It's a really great deal. Or, or you know, so, so you start inserting your, your comments already. But the, the classic example that would work is, you know, you have somehow you've got a list of, in, I have a list of investors and in exchange for a flat fee, $1,000, $10,000, $50,000, I will give you this list of investors and their email addresses and you can go reach out to them. Not transaction-based compensation. I'm certainly not getting in the middle of thing. I'm not making any recommendations. I'm not acting as a broker that potentially could work um, similar to sort of marketing emails. You know, if, if somebody has got a huge marketing list and you're going to say, Hey, I'm going to look kind of like influencers, or I'm going to pay, you know, I'll pay you $10,000 if you can send this one or, or this two or three email sequence. Uh, and I'm going to pay you regardless of whether they convert or anything happens. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the thing you want to do or, or could potentially do, but it's just very difficult. Um, it, those scenarios don't typically apply. What people want to be able to do is just make a referral. And then you want to, compensate them the one that i've heard and this is not a this is not sort of an official one but you know you know i scratch your back you scratch my back i mean if you're really a true great syndicator uh you know maybe you've got somebody who's not maybe yours just filled up or maybe you know you're doing a ground up development and your investor is looking for something different cash flow and so you can make a referral to a co syndicator so you're helping out your your client and then in return you know they'll, they'll send somebody your way as well um, you know, because, you know, again, you're, you're trying to do the best for your particular investor and your particular deal may not be the, the, the best deal for them. And so you're always trying to help. The best thing you should do is, is try and figure out how you can help and add value to your investor. But it's very difficult. Um, it's just um, people get into trouble because it's, it's inevit inevitably becomes a transaction based and it's, you know, dependent on. Uh, and then don't forget the disclosure. If you're going to do the emails and all that stuff, and, and you want to make sure that you're disclosing that compensation as well, right? So if I, if I, if I ask you to do an email, there's going to have to be somewhere that says, hey, I'm getting compensated for, for producing this, this email, which again, also some people don't want to do that. So it's very difficult. I, I, would, I would generally stay away with it. It's okay to accept the referral if you're a syndicator. As we've talked about before, you don't have to have a pre-existing substantive relationship. So if somebody refers you an investor, great, but you just can't compensate them. Thank you. Know? you. All right, guys. Uh, I thought that was a good one. I was excited about it. I think uh, a lot of people are talking about KP. So uh, I appreciate you guys uh, sticking around and uh, looking forward to, to next week's uh, live. And I'll, uh, I'll send an email properly this week. And uh, we're going to do something special, I think, next week or something unique. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted. But thanks for everyone for joining. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.